The, uh, the quantum leap I'd like to talk about is uh, an area really uh, now uh, emerging that's called synthetic biology. And um, synthetic biology then takes the immune enhancement that you just heard about uh, a step further, which is to, tr to engineer the immune system to be more powerful than it was made by nature. And um, engineering lymphocytes, I think, is, will be the first area where uh, synthetic biology enters the clinic. And, and at this point, we have uh, within healthcare structure and, and in our health delivery for cancer, we have really uh, three uh, approaches that, that are in routine care. We have uh, a standard uh, drugs, now including uh, small molecules. We've had over the last, uh, oh, just over a decade now, uh, uh, recombinant uh, proteins such as antibodies first with rituximab and leukemia, and now most recently, ipilimumab. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've had devices such as uh, used to, to deliver radiotherapy. Where we're going to head to is, is a, there will be a fourth pillar in this um, structure, and that will be uh, cell therapies. Um, and at this point, it's hard to imagine how one could use your own cells and, and, and deliver those in a way that would be scalable. Um, I'll point you to the fact that we, they thought the same thing with red blood cell transfusion, and, and it required the discovery of ways to type blood, and then the, the Red Cross occurred, and, and blood transfusion happens every day. At this point, we don't have uh, successful cell therapy with gene therapy. It hasn't been done yet, but I think it's on the horizon. Um, and the first cell therapy that was FDA approved with an autologous, so-called N of 1, so all other drugs are made in big lots, and they're, they're FDA approved that way. Um, an N of 1 therapy is where it's individually approved, as is a red blood cell, you know, if you donate your cells. It's for one person. And uh, the first one to be approved was Provenge for prostate cancer back in May of 2010. It's had a controversial launch. It's been difficult to scale it up, and, um, you know, but it is the first, and it has been incontrovertibly shown to enhance survival in patients with metastatic cancer, uh, prostate cancer. Um, there was an uh, editorial in Nature Medicine accompanying this launch, and, um, and there are optimists and pessimists, as there always are, and the optimists, as, and I'm in that camp, are that this is the first of many to come. And there were pessimists who said, well, we've been talking about this for at least 20 years, and we still only have one. So we'll see where it goes. I'll show you data with, that we um, has emerged from our group um, over the last year now that, that's very exciting that perhaps we can go to the next step in this area. So I'm going to give you an overview of uh, personalized T-cell therapies. T-cells are made in the thymus. They live the rest of our lives. They are the cells that kill the tumors that you just heard about that ipilimumab activates. The problem with them, unlike red cells, is that there is no universal donor for T-cells. So unless you have an identical twin, the T-cells that are used in therapy have to be your own. And that has meant that the, the way this will be done is that a patient donates their own cells, they go to a laboratory, they're engineered, and then they're returned back to the patient. Um, so in the, in the space of cancer therapy, we've had initially drugs that have been dis discovered, uh, um, some by accident and some by screening, um, that are nonspecific. Uh, they cause lots of side effects, but they have been the, 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 the foundation of what we've used. In the late 1990s, we had antibodies were uh, made, and at the time they came out, the monoclonal antibodies were discovered in 1979. Lee Nadler at Harvard gave the first antibody to a cancer patient in 1981, and, and everyone said it would never happen as a commercial therapy because they thought it was too expensive to make antibodies. And, uh, when the pharmaceutical industry finally got interested in this, uh, the biotech evolution and revolution occurred, they, they made antibodies thousands of times cheaper than they had ever imagined could be done. Um, the problem, though, still with these antibodies is they need to be given uh, usually every three to four weeks um, because they, they, uh, have, and they're, they're metabolized just like other drugs, and they're expensive. So in the case of Perceptin uh, or uh, Avastin, commonly given for lung and brain cancer, that's fifty to $100,000 a year per patient. So we, we can't sustain that. 
we need to have a new wave of therapies that, that can be uh, cheaper. And targeted therapies, and in particular cell therapies that can be self-replicating, can be a way to make, uh, have the permanent effects and, and uh, less toxic as, as the antibodies are, but not have to have recursive uh, addition. And, and I'll explain how that can happen. A, a bone marrow transplant was the first cell therapy ever used for um, in, in routine practice. And, and the way it's done is that a, a donor is identified, usually a brother or sister, and then the patient receives chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and then a new set of stem cells and immune cells coming in from the donor are given to the patient. The problem with that for, in particular, prostate cancer is that it can't be done in elderly patients. It's usually done in uh, children, and uh, it works well, but it requires, in most of the patients, lifelong immunosuppression to prevent uh, graft-versus-host disease, which is where the incoming uh, immune system attacks the patient as well as the tumor. So if we could engineer your own cells to do this, uh, then we could replace bone marrow transplants, but still have the potent effects that occur with um, a bone marrow transplant, which was the first therapy really to kill uh, and cure leukemia other than the routine uh, uh, chemotherapy-treated leukemias that occur in children. Um, so the issues with making personalized cells like this are, have been that it requires the, the patient's own immune system to be engineered. Um, and um, then how would that be done? Would it be done at, a, uh, at, at each individual center? Uh, such as uh, a Red Cross model where, where blood donation occurs, uh, or would it be done in a central manufacturing facility? Um, and there, this is an area where there's been uh, a very large valley of death and market failure because the pharmaceutical industry has not um, invested in this area um, until just recently. And um, so it's, it's a therapy that's been literally done only by a handful of investigators uh, to date um, until very recently, and it's uh, been entirely developed within the academic settings uh, without any uh, uh, pharmaceutical help. Now, that all changed last month. So on August 6th, uh, Novartis announced an alliance with the University of Pennsylvania and the intent to commercialize and make this uh, therapy FDA approved. So finally now, the pharmaceutical industry has entered into the era of cell therapies, um, and it won't just be done in boutique centers such as our cancer center uh, in, in Philadelphia. So how did we get there? We first found that the way to grow T cells is a, is a molecule, a co-stimulatory molecule called CD28, and that we could activate that molecule with an antibody uh, immobilized on beads. And in, the, in the picture on the upper right, the beads are brown, they have iron, they're paramagnetic, and um, can be removed from the culture system, at leaving the T cells behind by a set of uh, magnets shown in the, in the lower fo uh, photo. And then <clears throat> we first began using these uh, beads, a T cell growth system, to, to activate t, t cells and return them to patients with HIV because it was a ethically deemed the, the best way to test T cell infusions um, because these were patients who had lost their T cells through the effects of the, of the AIDS virus. And we found that it worked very effectively. It, it normalized the T cell counts in patients with late stage AIDS and without any side effects. Uh, then in 2001, we did the first cancer trials uh, using the same approach to grow T cells, but without genetic engineering. And we found that that uh, was safe uh, uh, and restored tumor immunity in patients um, and, and with very minor side effects. And so the, the manufacturing process is shown here um, in more detail. The, the T cells are, are obtained from the patient at a blood bank, and then they're grown for 10 days uh, with the beads. Um, and then uh, they're, they're uh, given to the patient. They look like white blood cells uh, when they're given. So chimeric antigen receptors are, were then the next step. And a chimeric antigen receptor, or so-called CAR, is is the idea of introducing an antibody into a T cell. Antibodies are normally made by the immune system by B cells. So by making a chimeric antigen receptor, we have the properties of a B, B cell and a T cell. So the T cell now, which is a killer cell, is now able to also deliver antibody therapy. And it looks like this cartoon. 
um, where um, there's an antibody termed SCFV, that's a, a fragment that binds the tumor antigen, and then there's a business end inside the T cell, which has a CD28 molecule and other molecules that activate the T cell and tell it to kill and to divide. And the cartoon uh, was in the New York Times last year after we reported the results in our first three patients on, on how actually this is uh, delivered. And, and so it begins with the blood transfusion process. The T cells are removed from the cancer patient. And then uh, we use an AIDS virus that's been gutted, uh, if you will, so it's non-pathogenic. But the AIDS virus evolved to infect human T cells and is very efficient at delivering new genetic material into the T cells. And so we were able to use that. Uh, it has parts of DNA from a uh, mouse. That's where our antibody came from. Human DNA for the CD28 molecules and um, uh, there's other cow and other species of viruses that are all in there that, that make this antibody be expressed permanently in the T cells. The T cells then become leukemia specific killers. In this case, killing any T cell uh, target that has CD19 on it. And um, uh, then they have uh, then persisted in the patients now uh, for out uh, past two years after a single infusion. And when we reported this last year, we had three patients. We had to stop our trial at that point because we had no more money to continue past three patients and uh, uh, couldn't get funding from the National Cancer Institute to do that. We now have funding to continue and we have treated 10 patients. Seven out of the 10 with end-stage leukemia have responded uh, with five complete remissions and two partial responses. And Interestingly, no one who's had a partial or complete response has, has relapsed. The first patient was Bill Ludwig, who was a retired prison warden, 65-year-old man, was covered in the New York Times, and he remains in remission now uh, beyond two years, following a single treatment. So, so the generalities from and lessons from the first three patients are shown here. They all had very late-stage uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, that was resistant to chemotherapy and had relapsed. It was very bulky with three and a half to seven pounds of tumor in each patient. And we could show first time quantitatively that each infused T cell killed more than a thousand uh, tumor cells. So that's what's called a serial killer in, in immune terms. And serial killer T cells are what we have normally in the natural immune system. And that's how we eliminate viruses. In this case, we could show that they can be reprogrammed and do the same thing on tumor cells. So um, we now have more follow-up on those first three patients, and this shows patients one and three. Uh, it's, it's flow cytometry data, and we can detect these antibody uh, expressing T cells now out of two years in each patient, both in the blood and in the bone marrow, and they have no leukemia cells. So this is the first time now that antibody delivery has been made long-term with a single infusion of cells. Uh, so obviating the need to give it every three to four weeks. So there are a lot of issues at this point. Um, we, we still don't know why these T cells weren't rejected. Um, they had mouse antibody in them. We expected them only to last about six weeks. We don't know how they've lasted a long time. A uh, term now is memory car T cells, and we're studying that scientific mechanism. And, and we don't know yet if this will work in patients with early stage cancer. We've only treated patients who have literally have pounds of tumor. Will this work as a consolidative mechanism in patients who have lower tumor burden? Or do the patients actually need to have high tumor burden to drive the expansion of these T cells? And we have to find and, uh, and demonstrate the long-term safety of this approach by uh, the FDA regulations. Each patient has to be followed for 15 years. Uh, if they're on a gene transfer protocol. So the initial report was uh, just over a year ago, um, and about two days later, Howard called me up, as he mentioned, and uh, we, we're now working on adapting this in, from leukemia into uh, prostate cancer. There, this was the first time, really, that a gene therapy has been discussed much in public. Um, and, and there's, what we found out is that there's a lot of uh, education that needs to be done for the public to understand this kind of transfusion medicine, gene transfer, and, and how the, the immune system can be enhanced. In the LA Times article was covered showing the picture of a child uh, who had undergone an immune replacement therapy at, at City of Hope. We just recently now have become, uh, be, begun treating uh, acute leukemia such as that does occur in children, and I'll show that result here. So the first patient we treated was done um, at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, and it was a seven-year-old 
a girl who had very chemotherapy refractory and, and <coughs> relapsed uh, leukemia um, that was unable to be put in remission. And um, she had uh, disease throughout her body, including <coughs> a spleen, uh, liver, kidneys, brain. And 60% of her bone marrow was uh, leukemia cells. And uh, so she was infused with a single infusion of the T cells, uh, CAR T cells in April, and uh, given no additional chemotherapy. That resulted in uh, between day six and 23, you can see on the left, she had 3% of her T cells were CAR cells, and 47% of the cells in her bone marrow were um, leukemia cells. And then on day 23, she now had massive expansion of these CAR T cells so that there were 75% of the T cells in her body and no detectable leukemia. So within a month, she was put in remission. Um, but it was not easy. She was very ill. She was DNR uh, when we started. And she had um, what's called tumor lysis syndrome in, in this setting of uh, relapsed refractory uh, leukemia, ALL. And, and she nearly died from that. This is called cytokine storm. So six days after she was treated, she had 104 degree fever. She was hypotensive and intubated. That abated, but it was caused by cytokines that are made by T cells when they attack the tumor cells. And this is our main major challenge now is to learn how to, to manage this. Uh, she's now fine. She was discharged, um, this shows a day after her, uh, her infusion and then uh, uh, she was made an honorary policeman on July 27th. Uh, her father's in a police force. They live in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, and then she began school last week. Um, so our goals over the next five years are to get this FDA approved in both children and adults. Um, CLL has a um, epidemiology very much like prostate cancer. CLL occurs more in men and it's uh, rarely in people under age 40, it's usually age 65, median age of onset. Um, and uh, another goal is, uh, you know, not just getting FDA approval in, in leukemias, but then to adapt this approach into solid tumors. And, and we and a handful of others are, are attempting to do this now. And uh, we uh, believe we'll have a trial open for prostate cancer uh, in 2013 with sponsorship by the PCF, and I want to thank, thank them for that uh, sponsorship. Um, we're working now with Novartis on making robotic T-cell culturing systems so that it's not a hands-on process. And then our other major goal is to learn how to manage uh, the toxicities caused by CARs, which are tumor lysis syndrome and uh, uh, cytokine release syndrome, TLS and CRS. And with that, um, we are also working on making uh, next generation cars. The classic car is one that has a TC, a T cell receptor zeta chain only signaling module. Uh, the one we used in our leukemia trials is a so-called second generation car that has a 4MBB or CD28 signaling module in it that uh, results in the T cell to proliferate when it encounters its target as well as killing the target. And then we now have more souped up cars, so-called muscle cars that we're developing for prostate cancer to help it work better in the tumor microenvironment that you find in solid cancers that's different from uh, leukemias. Um, we have a number of trials open now at, at, at our cancer center using engineered T cells. Some of them are listed here, and, and as I mentioned, we'll have one for prostate cancer uh, next year. And I'd like to close with that and uh, maybe time for some questions. A couple of questions for Dr. June. There are microphones here. Dr. June, I've been deputized by a couple of my buddies who are about to uh, receive Provenge to pay careful attention today. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, how is your approach to engineering the T cells different from the, from the Provenge approach? And my second question, which is also for Dr. Wolchak, is, do you think that um, administering IPI before Provenge or in combination with Provenge will improve the uh, effectiveness? Uh, so th those are great questions. So in the case of Provenge, it's a different kind of cell. It, it is also made in the bone marrow, but it's called a dendritic cell. And, and it's not gene modified. So it's more like a blood transfusion in that they're 
what the ProVenge process is, is to remove dendritic cells from the patient and then, and then lab over a two-day culture period, make them into a vaccine so that they have some proteins that would be found in a prostate cancer. And then they're returned back to the patient. And there, what they do in the patient is stimulate uh, T cells to grow. And the T cells then are what kill the, the, the cancer. And as far as, uh, you know, I think the idea that there's very good data in mice that you can augment the effect of a cancer vaccine like Provenge with ipilimumab. And I'm, uh, I know the trials such as that are underway now. And um, you know, it'll take time, unfortunately, in prostate cancer to show the effects. We need to look at survival data and so on. But I, I'm optimistic that the, the effects of Provenge will be very much synergistic with um, ipilimumab and other checkpoint blockade therapies. I'll just uh, respond to that excellent question about uh, Provenge with ipilimumab. I think that introducing a vaccine like, uh, like Provenge in the context of CTLA-4 blockade is a, is a great idea. Um, in the melanoma trial, it didn't really add additional benefit, but I think timing needs to be studied very carefully, as well as what the kind of vaccine is. And uh, I agree with what Carl just shared, which is that uh, using these antibodies in the context of the cell therapies is also a very exciting next step as well. Maybe I'll ask the final question. Um, there, there is a robust program in engineered T cells at Sloan Kettering with Michelle Sadelin and his, his group. Maybe you could just compare and contrast briefly how you're different uh, in terms of what they're doing at, in New York. So um, w my good friend Michelle Sadelin and his colleague Rainier Brentrins, we're now working with them through an NCI-sponsored mechanism called a strap grant to actually understand the differences because quite frankly our result was much better than we expected and we're not sure yet what it is in the ingredients and what we've done that's different than elsewhere as to why it works the way it is and, and some of the variables are the way we've introduced the car into the T cells we've used a, uh, an engineered uh, AIDS virus they've used a murine retrovirus uh, so that's one major variable we've used a different antibody. We both target CD19, but we have different single chain antibodies and it could be the binding site or the affinity of that and we're, we're exploring, exploring that. And then the final difference that's significant probably is the signaling domains inside the cell. So mm -hmm. we're in doing mix and matches uh, just beginning that. We have two patients enrolled on a leukemia trial now to compare the, uh, the, uh, the cars to, to understand what, what really needs to be optimized because it shows one major lesson, which I think we all know, but we need to keep relearning, which is minor differences in a science experiment can make a complete difference in, in the outcomes. Indeed. Maybe one more, Jonathan, you had a question. Hey, Carl, um, that's fantastic. Uh, we lost Carl C. in two years to, to poor um, Liebeck and a transplant. And we lost Marty Abel off um, three years before um, CD19 became the most interesting story maybe in the last 20 years. Um, how engaged is the FDA in understanding that um, this is absolutely a quantum leap if all we ever do is achieve this for CD9 overexpression, CLL? Um, how engaged is the FDA already? So uh, that's a great question. And, you know, we never in our academic boutique things could could even broach that question. Now with Novartis, uh, that's, those are conversations are just beginning. The, um, and, and on Sunday, we're going to discuss some of this. The, there has been an FDA initiative called Breakthrough Therapies, and um, this may qualify as one of those. And so as an orphan approach, it may have rapid approval. And that's what we're trying to do, at least to start within these end-stage leukemia patients. Uh, so that, that's conversations just beginning. There's a special branch of the FDA that deals with cell and gene therapies called uh, the office cell and tissue and gene therapies, which is within CBER. So they, they've never had anything like this become FDA approved. There are issues both the lentiviral vector manufacturing, uh, the safety will take 15 years to establish. Um, so it's unlike, you know, drugs that are given and they're metabolized. These la will last lifelong in patients. So we need to learn the rules of the road, and the FDA really is at the very beginning of this process. Great. Thank you. Thanks.